coming back to life. In the ancient world, how common was this belief? Is it unique to the Hebrew Bible or Christianity? I want to reference something in Herodotus, Book 4, 94 to 96. As to immortality, the Gitai believe that they do not really die, but that when one of them passes away, he goes to Salmoxus, a sort of divinity whom some of them also call Gebelaziz. Every fifth year they send off one of their number who has been selected by a lot to serve as a messenger to Salmoxus with instructions as to what they want at that particular time. This is how they dispatch him. Three men who are appointed to the task each hold a javelin, while others seize the hands and feet of the man being sent to Salmoxus. Swing him up into the air and throw him onto the points of the javelins. If the man dies from being impelled, they believe that the god is well disposed toward them. But if he does not die, they blame the messenger himself, accusing him of being a bad man, and seek another to send in his place. They give the messenger instructions while he is still alive. These same Thracians shoot their arrows up into the sky, aiming at thunder and lightning as they shout threats at the god. And they believe that no other god exists but their own. I have heard from Helenas, who inhabit the Hell's Point and the Pontus, however, that this Salmoxus was actually a human being who had been enslaved and served Pythagoras, son of Menarchos on Samos. But he was eventually freed and then he acquired abundant wealth there before returning to his own land. Now while the Thracians live a crude life and are rather stupid, Salmoxus knew the Ionian way of life and character, which is more profound than that of the Thracians, and he had associated with Hellenes, including Pythagoras, certainly not the feeblest thinker of the Hellens. And so he had a banqueting hall built where he hosted and entertained the leading men of the town. And he taught them that neither he nor they, his drinking companions, nor their descendants would die, but that they would come to a place where they would live on and have all the good things. As he was composing these lessons and relating them to his guests, he was also constructing an underground chamber when it was completely finished, he vanished from the sight of the Thracians by descending into the chamber and spending three years there. The Thracians missed him and grieved for him as though he had died. But in the fourth year, he appeared to them. And thus what Salmoxus had taught them became credible, that at least is what they said he did. Herodotus says, I myself do not believe this story about him and the underground chamber, although I do not discount it completely. I do think, however, that this Salmoxus lived many years before Pythagoras, but whether Salmoxus was born a human being or exists as some sort of native divinity among the Gatai, let us bid him ver farewell. At any rate, that is how the Gatai were subdued by the Persians, and they were now following along the rest of the army. Herodotus is a very old book, written long before Christianity. The building blocks to ideas that we see common patterns to and we're supposed to believe that christianity was a bubble with a force field protecting it from the rest of the world reading from a book coming back to life the permeability of past 
and present, mortality and immortality, death and life in the ancient Mediterranean. Written by Frederick S. Tapadin and Carly Daniel Hughes. Just to read an excerpt about the hero gods and the hero cults. Today, the communist opinion holds that hero cults as a very characteristic feature of ancient Greco-Roman religion started somewhere and somehow in the late 8th century BCE and were until their end in the late antiquity, a quite heterogeneous phenomenon. Nevertheless, it remains undisputed that heroes and hero cults have always, though not always in the same way, had something to do with death, tombs, and memory. This is shown clearly by two recent definitions which cannot help but include the notion of death. Thus formulates, a hero can be defined as a person who had lived and died, either in myth or in real life. This being the main distinction between a god and a hero in a comparable way. And Johnson in 1999 states, a hero was essentially a dead person who had retained more of his vitality after death. So one might summarize that the category of the hero helped to define and by its variability also to establish the boundaries between the living and the dead and the immortal gods. On the level of social political structures, hero cults always mediated between concerns of individual families and broader groups, such as the polis or even an empire. Whereas in archaic and classical times, hero cults were mainly bound to tombs and were in most cases run by the polis or its subgroups. In Hellenistic and Roman times, one finds considerable new developments, which are enumerated by Dennis D. Hughes in 1999 as follows. The founding of cults by private citizens for deceased family members, the designation of the dead as heroes on tombstones, public heroization of prominent benefactors, and the revival of traditional hero cults in the Roman period. In particular, the cults of great figures from early Greek history. Throughout this history, there seems to have always been a relationship between hero cults, the figure of the hero, and the conceptualization of place and space. As Fritz Graf demonstrates in his article on hero cults in Der New Poly, and here I summarize, Already in archaic and classical polis religion, there existed a few heroes who were situated somewhere between heroes and gods, namely Asclepius, the Dioscori, and Heracles. One might call them heroes, but they are like gods, or they even become gods. Graf reminds us that all hero cults have a trans-regional pan-Hellenic character. Hippolytus, whose hero cult already had a trans-regional character in archaic and classical times, resembles these ambivalent figures. And it is not by accident that he was combined in myth and cult with Asclepius. In Hellenistic and Roman times, his story becomes connected to the Latin deity Verbius, located in the famous sanctuary of Diana Nemerensis of Aricia, about 11 miles from Rome, along the Via Appia. It was told that he was brought back to life by Asclepius and or Diana, and then hidden in the precinct of Diana Nemerensis where he lived on as Verbius. 
In what follows, I would like to show exactly how the development from local mythologies to an international conglomerate of fantasy and the supernatural works in the case of the stories of Hippolytus coming back to life. It might not be caused only by the ease of communication and transport in the Roman Empire. In my opinion, the development of new kinds of stories about coming back to life in pagan as well as Jewish Christian discourses during Hellenistic and Imperial times is related to new and different functions and modes of religious storytelling as well as to new ideas about the boundaries between the living and the dead and especially between mortality and immortality as they were expressed in the discourses and rituals of the Hellenistic and Imperial ruler cult, especially in the apotheosis of the Roman Empire after death. The Augustan poets Virgil and Ovid were especially fascinated by the story and told it several times in different versions, where Euripides insists on a tomb of Hippolytus at Trozen, though he might also have known the version of Hippolytus brought back to life by Asclepius. The fact that Hippolytus' coming back to life was neglected by Euripides, but highly popular from Hellenistic times onward, does not come as a surprise. It fits into a growing general interest in highly unbelievable stories about ordinary people and or heroes who were brought back to life by spiritual powers or by God, him, herself. Whereas these stories formed, on the one hand, part of a new kind of Jewish Christian historiography, which starts with the narratives on the Maccabees and the bodily resurrection of the Maccabean martyrs and ends with the canonical gospels. We also find an ever-growing interest in the subject of coming back to life in the realm of pagan literature. In his fiction as history, Nero to Julian, not only reminds us of this remarkable fact, but also calls our attention to the basic problem of fiction and history, which in his eyes is immediately related to the spatial dimensions of empires, especially the Roman Empire. He thus states, the ease of communication and transport in the Roman Empire meant that local marvels were local no more. They soon merged into an international conglomerate of fantasy and the supernatural. History was being invented all over again. Even the mythic past was being rewritten, and the present was awash in so many miracles and marvels that not even the credulous or the pious could swallow them all. Bowers Rock, 1994. Epics and historiography, the classical genres that tell more or less marvelous but always authoritative stories about the past, were now supplemented by novels, gospels, demonstratively alternative historiographies, biographies, letters, dialogues, and so on, most of which were typical for the cultural productions of the so-called Second Sophistic. If I understand him correctly, Bowersock supposes that it was especially this kind of genre trouble which made it possible to spread stories about bodily resurrection. Moreover, he provokes with the thesis that the obvious fondness for stories about Shingtad and consequently as if resurrections in pagan novels was triggered by the first stories about the resurrection of Jesus 
and that the whole phenomenon was especially characteristic of the Neronian Epoch. As you could see, an evolution of thought is taking place with the idea of coming back to life and heroes and gods. I think we need to read far and wide when we start looking into the subject because then the superstitious bubble can pop and we no longer hold to double standards for Jesus as if this one among all of the entire zeitgeist of the ancient world is really the true myth as C.S. Lewis would put it. It's just another myth that holds characteristics of moral truths in some respects and outdated ideas in others.